considering three options and they're kind of made organically. Um, but if you're making this decision on scene in real time organically and you've never considered it, you could be making a poor choice. Whereas if you know this concept and you think about it beforehand, it can really help your decision making process maybe go faster or be more beneficial so that you don't make the wrong choice. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. We are officially doing the thing. All right, we got our outline here. First up, this is the most important thing. Thanks a million to the Patreon. We got a couple new signups. Um, I like to use the actual Patreon account to go through the list. So I saw that you signed up recently, a few people. Um, but at the beginning of every month, which might have kicked in by now, or you might have to wait a couple weeks, um, I'll do some shout outs when I get the official notification from Patreon that you're logged in for the full loop. That's a big deal for us. Uh, and again, we said on a recent episode, you might not have caught it. But if you're supporting our show, even at the $2 a month tip level, um, or anything above that that gets you access to our after show, which we will be recording after this, and we do after every show, almost every episode. Um, with your support on Patreon, you're not just supporting me. You're actually supporting a whole community of people like me that have said, fuck you to standard content, to big media, to big cable, to big internet. Uh, we have put our money where our mouths are, and we create custom content for you, for a custom audience, and we try to do so with absolutely no red tape preventing us from giving you the information that you want. So please, it really does mean the world to us if you're able to support us even for a little while, even at the, even at the $2 a month level, that would be a big deal. Um, and we do have a, a lot of fucking fun in the after shows. Um, we don't hide any super secret tactical information there, but we just goof off. We have a good time. Um, and I really have been enjoying that. So I think that's worth checking out at least for a little bit. Um, if you sign up for one month, I think you get access to all of our previous after show episodes. So if you are looking for more podcast content to consume and you do like our show, maybe hang out with us in the after show for a bit. That would mean a lot to us. If you want a high quality protection dog, please shoot me an email. Easiest way to get in touch with me is through email, and that's pat at utac.io. Official show topic. Let's dive right in. Dave, welcome. You want to give everyone the overview? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, really quick before we get into that, this is episode 223. How funny would it be if when we get to, to episode 556, we just do the exact same episode, except louder and more pressurized? <laughs> Make a note. Make yeah. Okay. Anyways, today's <laughs> <laughs> today's topic. Uh, we're going to be going into advanced lock picking concepts, especially target assessment. That's a huge part of what we do that we think is unique uh, to us and what we do well. We've done a few pr prior episodes to this, a little bit more focused on beginner content. So we wanted to kick it off with an advanced one tonight. First question for the listeners, we'll circle back to this later. When would you use a traveler's hook over a latch gym? So just kind of think about that one for a while. And Pat is going to take us into that target assessment. Okay, target assessment. Uh, this is in our tactical lock picking book. If you're interested in buying that, be aware that there are some copycats on Amazon. Uh, you're not looking for tactical lock picking by latch latcherson. You want tactical lock picking. By Pat Watson. That's me. That's a big book. It's almost 300 pages. It's like it's like the size of a standard no, piece of printer paper. Uh, full page photos on lots of pages. Uh, it's got a big door on the front. It says tactical lock picking, and the subtitle is a systemized approach to re for responding to locked obstacles during emergencies. If you want the paperback version, I recommend you get it from our gear store and our website. That way, you're getting it directly from me. Um, and you know you're getting the right thing. Just head over to uncensoredtactical.com and click on the uh, drop-down menu that brings you to our store. Uh, I don't think that's a shameless plug. I think that one is very specifically related to our content. So in the book, we have a whole chapter on target assessment. Uh, we have divided this into s seven steps. The good news, like most of our other content, we don't give a shit whether you follow our steps or not. And if you're on an entry and you see a likely a really good likely entry point that you want to exploit, go nuts, go for it. 
Um, we have created this system to help you if you need it, and we don't think that you should have to show your work just to show your work. Um, so here's those seven steps. Number one and number two happen almost automatically, but it's good to be aware of them so that if for some reason you don't have that information, you can get that during your entry. So step one is moral right to make entry. Are you doing what's morally right? Uh, and we're not going to get political today, so I'll keep this really short. Short answer is to figure out if you're doing what's morally right, it's more than a one-step process. You don't just go, am I the good guy? Yep, then we're good. That's not it. Go at least one or two levels above that and say, is this morally right? Is this person? Is this lock that I'm getting through, ha- do I have permission to open this lock from the rightful owner? And that's different than, do I have permission? Because if your boss tells you to open something, well, you're following orders. But if the rightful owner is giving you permission, that might be a different person than your boss. So do some due diligence. Make sure you're doing what's morally right. Uh, I don't, again, we're not staying political, but if you read a fucking history book, you'll see lots of examples of things that were very clearly morally wrong, but they were legal. So those are not the same things. So step one, am I doing the right thing? Step two, what is the speed in which I have to make entry? We divide that uh, into three different parts. Uh, The first one is administrative. And that's for something like a homeowner that says, oh, I got that project coming up next weekend. Oh, I don't have the key for my shed out back and there's a padlock on it. That's what we call an administrative entry, meaning there is no rush. There is no risk. We can take our sweet time. Uh, Next, we have uh, a phase I like to refer to as the quicker, the better. That means there's a situation that is either deteriorating or there's a big benefit if we get in much quicker, or there's less risk if we get in um, a different, you know, using a non-destructive entry method. Then there is the, oh my God, someone's hair is on fire inside method, which is uh, er- extreme urgency, which means while lock picking still might be a good answer, um, you're also in the destructive range, meaning destruction of property is fine because we're doing something that's so urgent that we're saving a life. Um, a lot of firefighters operate in that realm all the time. Um, uh, and we're even with firefighters, um, they're very good at using their tools to make entry, but it takes a lot of energy. Um, and some, not, not a ton, but sometimes it could take quite a bit of force and energy, um, and logistics to get their tools to open a locked door. And some of those times that's the best method. Other times you can take a laminated sheet of paper and slide it through the door frame and you have complete access to an unlocked door. So uh, just because destructive entry is pretty quick sometimes doesn't mean a lock picking can't be quicker. So let's bring it back full circle. Number one, do I have the moral right to make entry? Number two, what speed do I have to operate in? And these things can change. So you can lose that moral right to make entry. So if someone specifically gives you permission to help them get through a locked obstacle and then they withdraw that permission before you get in, then you no longer have that moral right and you must stop your entry. So these can change. Uh, The speed, you could go from administrative into, hey, the quicker the better, into, oh my God, emergency, and back and forth. So things to consider, you should always be reassessing your entry. Step one, moral right to make entry. Step two, what's the speed? Now we have our physical steps. Uh, So step three would be the attack vector. So as you're, this could happen in different places too. So you can be driving to a call and someone can call you and say, hey, here's what I got. So via telephone, you might not even have seen the locked obstacle yet, but someone that is on scene can be telling you, hey, I have a door that looks like this. It's got a handle. What do you think? And you could be driving going, okay, well, what about this? What about that? And they can be your eyes on scene. Or if you're walking up to a house, you should be going, okay, there's a ground floor window, there's a garage door, there's probably a side door on the side of that garage, there's the front door, let's go look at the front door. And as you walk up to the front door, you're assessing your attack vectors. So which different things can we exploit? And as you get up to the door, you can go either I see the hinges or I don't see the hinges. That will tell you which way the door swings. You can look at, is there a deadbolt with a key? Or is there a knob, a keyed knob there? Is it a handled knob? Um, You can say, is it an advanced or an easy keyway to pick just based off of sight? Um, You can say, you know, either you can see the latch and the deadbolt or you can't. I mean, if you can see them, are they very tightly and securely fit or are they kind of loose and scraggly, meaning you can easily access them? 
So identifying your, ita your attack vectors. This is our target assessment process that we're giving you. Do I have the moral right to make entry? Yes. Okay, continue. What's the speed? Well, if you can get in quick, that'd be better. Okay, cool. What's my attack vector? Oh, okay, we got hinges, we got doorknob, we got deadbolt, we have windows, we have the rest of the perimeter of the house, which we haven't checked yet. Okay, cool. Next is your m manual unlock check, which is if you're standing at the front door, you try the fucking handle. And this is not just one step, uh, like you just twist left, twist right. Nope, it's locked. You put some effort into it. You squeeze really hard and twist to the left. Squeeze really hard, twist to the right. You push the door, you pull the door, and then you use all your different motion options. Like if it's a handle, you don't just push the handle down to rotate it and twist it. You also rotate the handle up. You go clockwise, counterclockwise, left, right, push, pull, up, down. You do all the things to double and triple check to see if the obstacle is actually unlocked and you just don't know it. So that's your manual unlock check. Works the same way for windows, works the same way for vehicles. Check all the doors of a vehicle, that's your manual unlock check. Check the trunk of the vehicle, see if that opens. Um, so your manual unlock check, it works for padlocks too. Push the padlock, pull the padlock, twist it, all sorts of things. So really check and see if that thing's unlocked. Even some very, what you can call highly intelligent people that tie their own shoes, have called me to go assist them with entries and I've showed up and I've turned the doorknob really hard and it's unlocked. So some, some doorknobs and some locks just have a lot of play in them and there's a lot of slack and a lot of play, but then it gets very tight when you have to apply the actual leverage to open the lock. And so people just make mistakes, it happens. We wrote this down for a reason so that you can learn from it. And this is a really good foundation we're gonna talk about, but we're also gonna do some advanced um, concepts for lock picking in this episode too, but we're laying some groundwork here. So I do my manual unlock check and let's say, Oh, the door's still locked. The next step is going to be tool availability. That's what tools do I have on me now? What tools are close by to me? Uh, what tools can I have brought to me and what tools could I make shift from my environment as well as, is there a hidden key stored nearby or a code written down nearby that I can read? Now you have lots of options. Some of them are as quick and as easy to check as uh, just a quick glance. Like if I touch my pocket and I go, yep, I got my first line kit. I know exactly what's in there. I know the tools I have. And I go, well, I know what's in my car. I have my kit there too. And I go, well, I can see the top of the door frame. Oh, there's probably room for a key up there. Let me feel. Okay, we're good. No, no key. I checked. Oh, there's a doormat. Let me check under the doormat. Oh, no, no key there. That's pretty quick. That's important. That could have been an effective entry success right there. And you haven't wasted a lot of time by doing that, but at least you've made a smart process choice so far. So tool availability is what tools do I have access to in all those different realms? Then if you know what tools you have on you and you know what locks or what portions of a locking system you have to exploit, you get to decide, do any of those pair up? Yeah, a bunch of them do. I have picks and rakes for the keyways. Uh, I have some latch slip tools for the latches. Uh, I have a couple pry bars and airbags to use to get leverage. Uh, okay, cool. I got all these things. Now you've, you've decided which tools you have available. And then you go now or later. That's the next step for N, now or later. And you get to decide, do I use some of these tools to attack some of these attack vectors now or should I still be assessing before I start my physical entry? Meaning, do I have the time and is it reasonable to take a walk around this house or whatever facility or target you're looking at? Should I check a little bit more thoroughly to look for a really easy entry point before I commit to trying to make my entry? So this is the now or later step. If you have a, very, a tool with a high likelihood of success and the time it takes to implement that tool is very low, and the lock looks like it's susceptible to that type of attack. Of course, you take your little tool out, you put it in the thing, you do the thing. Oh, look, it's open. You win. Or because it only takes a short amount of time and because you have the tool on you and the attack vector readily available, you put the thing in, you try it for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and you go, no, this isn't working. So then you reassess. You can try another tool and another attack vector nearby, or you can, instead of going, Instead of the now portion of now or later, you can go later and you put that on pause and you go, you know what? I thought this one really quick tool would work really quickly, but it didn't. So now I'm going to check around the back of the house, look for another possibly open door. And so you continue your journey. 
maybe you walk past the garage door, you get to the side human door for the garage, and you go, oh, wow, that's old. That's probably never been replaced. It's really loose and sloppy. Oh, look, I can see the latch. There's only a bottom latch. It's not installed properly. I can open that with a coat hanger. So you reach in your pocket, you grab one little tool from your wallet, and you go slip, and that latch opens, and now you have access. So that's the now or later phase. Do you make entry now, or do you check some other stuff out first? Last one we have is other resources, which is taking a reset breath. Take your tools out. Close your eyes if you can. Breathe. Actually breathe in deeply. Actually breathe out. And now you have lots of options. This is the icing on the cake. You can reassess all of the stuff you've done so far to see if you missed something. You can continue to check for other entry exploits. You can go on the internet and say, hey, this lock, I can't open it. Let's see if I can see a video of someone opening it, and maybe that will give me some insight. Or you can have a tool brought to you. Or you can call someone for advice. Those are all resources at your disposal. Or you can call a locksmith. Or you can call someone that has a key. Or now you can go, oh, I didn't look for a hidden key. There might be a key hidden nearby. So all these things are very advanced, but also very foundational skills that someone can use to make an effective and efficient entry with lock picking. You can also use the this, this same profile for things like uh, forcible entry, like the firefighters. Um, the tools aren't important, but the way that you make decisions is important. So I'm going to take a deep breath and take a sip of my Lone Pint brewed root beer from a really nice local brewery. And I'm going to let Dave fill in for a second. Yeah, and we have speed and urgency on there as well as now or later. So I just wanted to point out that uh, speed and urgency is, like you said, intuitive with moral right. And that's going to be deciding if the entry is justified or a broader picture of is it justified to just smash a window? Whereas when we did the now or later, that is more getting into the nitty gritty of the specific tools and processes you're using. Would you say that that's fair differentiation between those two? Uh, I, I don't know. Speed and urgency to me are the same thing. How urgent do I have to be? What's the speed I have to move in? I think they're the same thing. Would you? Let's start with just that step. What do you think? Oh, yeah. So I meant speed and urgency different from now or later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Speed and urgency is how fast do I have to get in? Uh, yes. Now or later is if you're standing at the front door of a house and there are other doors around the side and back of the house that you haven't checked yet, that has nothing to do with your speed. That has to do with should I take the tools out of my pocket and start picking open this front door or should I continue walking around the house looking for other obstacles before I start my physical entry? Perfect. Yeah. Just wanted to come back around and flesh those out. Um, uh, like let me give you that example. Specifically too. how. So yeah. commercially, let's say I walk up to a commercial door and let's say I parked kind of far away, like maybe across the street or maybe it's like up a really long stairwell. But let's say I have second line gear a little go bag with some more professional tools in the trunk of my car. And I've walked quite a long way, but I get to this commercial facility that I need to make entry to. Usually, but not always, commercial facilities are slightly more secure when it comes to standard entry-level lock picking. So let's say I get to the front door of this facility and I go, oh, it's a double, oh, it's a fully glass, floor-to-ceiling, double-swinging, double-door set. And I go, instantly, I go, I could definitely fit a double-door tool through that gap and hit that um, bumper plate, and that door will pop right open. But all I have in my pocket is my first-line gear, and that won't do the trick. So I'd have to walk all the way back to my car to get that tool, and then all the way back to this double door. So in that case, I might go, I'm not going to start picking this lock because it's too high security for me. And then I'll go, I'm also going to walk around the side of the building so I'm making the later decision, meaning I'm not going to put my tool in the door for lock picking. I'm not going to go get my second line gear bag yet, but if I have another person, I might send them to do that. So now I'm doing what's called uh, st function stacking or I'm um, use using resources. Excuse me. So I'm using other resources that I have on scene um, at the same time so that we're not wasting time trying one thing, waiting, trying the next. We're actually doing two things at once. And I'll be walking around the rest of the facility 
until I see something where I hopefully I'll see something where I go, oh, it, this could probably be faster right here, this entry. Um, that's now or later deciding, do I put my tool in the, in the door or the hole or whatever, or do I look for other options first? Have I beat that horse to death yet? We're really good at that. Yeah. Yeah. And a uh, comment on manual unlock check. It helps a lot if you have someone else watch you because for literally anything, the second you ask for help, you just look like an idiot because whatever you just ask someone to watch you do, it'll always make you look like an idiot. You'll say it's stuck. Someone comes over to watch you do it. It pops right open. Not literally a step, but just seems like that's how it always goes. I always just look dumb the second someone starts observing. It's like quantum entry concepts. The uh, observation changes changes the entry. And it's funny, too, because lockpicking is kind of the opposite. If uh, someone Someone's is watching you. you try to rake open a lock, you'll just look dumb because you won't rake it open because someone's watching. Uh, away, so really... Go. Got it. <laughs> so not a real point but god it just always seems to go that way um uh, and i would say too i love these things because we're getting into the concept of trade-offs for both time and tools so this is an advanced concept because now you're thinking in trade-offs and opportunity cost which is just a whole nother level of oh hey there's a lock will this tool work Okay, great. Let me academically write three paragraphs about why this tool will will or won't work. That's valuable. It's good. But now we're getting into the next level of stuff of regardless if the tool will work or not, what other upstream trade-offs do you have to make? If you put a specialized tool in your second line bag, what do you have to take out to make it fit? And just being aware of this systemized approach and aware of these trade-offs and time trade-offs too. Time is always finite. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's one of the biggest. That's my favorite part of the target assessment. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest things and that we teach that's is, what I think is the time is, efficiency. Yeah. I got a lag. Sorry. I'll stop talking. I'll let you finish. Yeah. And Oh, no. I was going to say, I think that's one of the biggest le- level ups from going from a mindset of tool versus lock to to a systemized approach. Also, too, flustered, stressed, whatever. Again, you don't you don't have to memorize these, but just having something that you routinely fall back to, almost like muscle memory of always do the same things in the same order, roughly. So if you build that into your training to try a manual unlock check, it builds it into something that you don't have to think about. Or if you're stumped, it helps to have a systemized thing to go back through versus just trying to reach into the ether and think of ideas. Um, yeah, so that's what I got on that. I like it. Okay, that was a long segment, and it was kind of intense. I was just screaming at the mic nonstop for the opening here. So that segment was on what we call target assessment meaning how I assess a target when I need to make entry. And it doesn't matter if the target is a chain Ooh. wrapped around a vehicle gate or like a pedestrian gate, or if it's a house, or if it's a business, or if it's a huge facility. Um, we are assessing the locked obstacle, no matter how large or small. Pat, can you yeah. step aside a second and hand me the bat so I can beat the horse? Yeah, go for it. Go nuts. We can do whatever right. we want. Go nuts. So with like things like the manual unlock check, I forget where I heard it. I'm sure multiple sources, but in training, I really like the concept of never waste a repetition. Uh, so that's kind of something that I, I like to do with dry fire. Just meaning that if I'm doing like even a dry fire reload or anytime I'm putting a magazine in, don't waste the repetition. Just take like the half a second to do it in a way that you would actually want to do it. You know, not just totally administrative. Never waste a repetition or two with training. Not that I I always succeed, but we're talking about the systemized approach. I like working things in, like trying a manual unlock. Uh, So that was point one. Point two is this 
systemized approach is geared towards emergency entry for the most part. We're going to be getting into more advanced stuff just in general with planning operations, which is an even more advanced concept just in the sense of if you're planning an operation that might even have an adversarial mindset type aspect to it. So not that it's advanced as in like, oh, we're so smart, but just it's just another layer of thinking on top of everything. So just wanted to throw that out for food for thought is the above is rock solid emergency lockout system. But as we go forward, keep an eye out for us uh, doing more content on planned operation entries. Okay, now I'm done with this segment. I just want to make sure people don't forget that this is called uncensored tactical. And it's not that we don't know about unit operations and military stuff and jumping out of helicopters and running a rifle. We just, we like what we do. And there's a, there's a big, I guess the biggest impact we can have on the world is sharing information that isn't readily available out there. So that's why we've chosen, um, to really dig into this uh, kind of niche market of not even market, but a uh, niche skill set. Um, but I like that phrase you said, so we're going to get off topic right here, but we're allowed to do that. So I yeah, like boy. the phrase you said, never waste a repetition. Um, it was, I might've said this a couple of times on the show already, but we had a bunch of new listeners, which I'm really thankful for. Um, seriously, like not, not just throwing it out there. It means a lot that you guys check out our content. It really does. Um, in multiple SWAT schools, um, whether it was our upkeep training back at base with our, our special forces staff, whether it was, um, in Camp Lejeune running their CQB, uh, kind of eight week program, whatever it was, I've been to multiple SWAT trainings and it was so fucking bizarre to me. Um, I, I understood when we were shooting paper, I understood, I understand when you're training and you're using, uh, you know, sim munitions in a shoot house and you're shooting paper with paint bullets and the instructors go, okay, you need to understand that if you have people that are alive, you need to detain them and we need to process them. Okay, great. But in those shoot houses, we still wouldn't process them the right. We wouldn't process quote unquote paper the right way. So we would go, okay, we're a six person team. We're going into a building that has 10 rooms in it. And in each room, there are good guys and bad guys. So at the end, we end up with like uh, 10 unknowns, 10 bad guys, you know, 10 dead, whatever. A bunch of people. Must have been a full house. So then we get to the end and we make our pretend radio call. We go lower. This is higher. They go, go ahead. And we go, we reach limit of advance. We, you know, we reach LOA, you know, whatever secure. We have this many good guys, this many bad guys. And then the pretend radio would go, okay. Bring your unknowns and your bad guys um, and transfer them back to the front of the building and we'll, we'll be ready for pickup. And they go, okay. And they point to one guy and they go, Pat, uh, pick up all the bad guys and the good guys and bring them out of the house. Okay, great. I'm going to pick up 10 fucking pieces of cardboard that say bad guy on the front and 10 pieces of cardboard that say good guy on the front. And I'll just carry 20 people out of this fucking building. Not how real life works. Now, I said already, I get it. I get that there are times when you have to play pretend. I understand that. We could have played pretend better by going, okay, one operator gets one person. So we're going to have someone stand in the marshalling area, which is where you keep all your people rounded up together and you set an overwatch. You keep one person on overwatch watching all 20 people. Then you take uh, maybe... the other three or four operators, whatever. And you'll bring two or three people. So you still have a winning ratio of more operators to less unknown people. And each operator will bring one piece of cardboard out of the building at a time. You'll drop them off at another marshalling point out front, hand them to another unit or agency or um, team member. And then you travel back into the building to get the other people. So you start managing the process as if you're moving real people, even though it's just cardboard. That would have been a great, that would have been great. That would have made me happy. At least we're pretending that these are real people, not, you know, Pat in the back holding 20 people in his huge brutish arms. It's not how this works. 
let's shift a little bit and then we'll get back on track here. We did move into simunitions with role players. So we were getting shot, we were shooting back, we had real humans, we had really good instructors, um, and we would down somebody, we'd go over, and we would dead check them, and they would be dead, and I would detain them. And part of that was, you know, do your eye thump, do your sternum rub, um, check for a pulse, whatever, either call medical or not, depending on whether the building or the facility is secured or not. Then you flip them over, you cross their legs, you put their hands behind their back, and you handcuff them, and you leave them. And you, if you have them, you crack a chem stick, and you drop it right on their back, and that tells the whole world this person is dead and processed. And it's safer, so the operators don't get shot by someone that comes back to life and has a hidden gun on them. Okay, that's great. In training, we were not allowed to handcuff our role players. Why? We can handcuff any fucking Joe Blow on the street for any fucking reason that we wanted to, politics aside. Our procedures were that we could handcuff anyone at any time. We were trusted to handcuff people within policy the right way, safely, and it wasn't a, wasn't a liability or a risk. We just fucking handcuff people. It's part of our job. But for some reason in the shoot house, it was scary or unnecessary or useless. I don't fucking know what their thought was, but I asked. I said, why are we not using this repetition? If we're shooting, shouldn't we go, okay, you cover them. I'll stow my weapon. I'll get my handcuffs. I'll use these fine motor skills while my hands are fucking shaking or my, while my heart's pumping or while we're still clearing other rooms or while we're holding security. This is a great rep. It's a great repetition. And I was told emphatically, no. Sorry, we don't do that here. Which is why Uncensored Tactical was created. We don't like the fucking red tape of being told what techniques we can teach you and what techniques we can't. So now, we teach you whatever the fuck we want. So thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, let's get back on track with our uh, podcast segments. Unless you want to beat that dead horse too, Dave. No, I uh, think that the bat actually just snapped in half. So we have nothing left to beat the horse with. Let's move on. Cool, this after show is going to be lit. All right, <laughs> what do you got next? Next segment. Ah. Let's save that one in case we need it for later. It's okay. nothing super I was going to say, crazy. I don't know what your notes mean, so that one's on you. Personal story. And I already gave one of those, so let's see how we, uh, how we do on the timeline. Next segment. Station gear, that one's all you. Go nuts. Cool. Uh, another advanced concept. Again, you can look up lots of cool locks and techniques on YouTube. Learn how to pair a tool with a lock. Even if that tool or technique takes a lot of practice that's still kind of a one-step thing of hey this lock is susceptible to this technique so you just because something is one step doesn't mean that it's easy but that is still more or less one step thinking even if it needs a lot of practice in the meantime so staging gear advanced concept because this is a multi-layer deep process this goes well beyond knowing what tools use on what obstacles this goes to where you want to sharpen your skill and be on that bleeding edge what are you doing before you even get to an obstacle before you even know what locked obstacles you might even face to set yourself up for quick efficient field op field operation we have a few examples um so for instance if you're getting into the key cutting game and you want to do it on the go in the field operationally one of the most helpful tools, if you have them on hand, are sets of keys called spacing in-depth sets. Without getting too lost in the specifics of how that works, you basically have pre-cut keys where the little valleys in the key, if you're just looking at your key, for each key specific to the brand are all cut to a known depth. So you use your reference keys to make a new key. That that's basically the short of it is you have reference keys that you can then use with field clippers to make your target key. But for each brand, um, you know, you have anywhere from six, seven, eight, nine different keys per brand per lock type. So even just staging these, do you get out to the field? It's dark, it's low light. You might not even have the option to use a bunch of light. Do you just reach into a backpack or a bag, 
and root around for them and try and figure out which is which? Or have you pre-staged them to allow you to operate in low light conditions, to allow you to operate under time constraints? So, Pat, I'll let you talk on this because I know that you went deep on, we even just nerded out about different types of keychains you could use just to organize these spacing and depth keys for when you are in low light scenarios under a time crunch. So tell us about the uh, keychain journey you had. Sure. This is exciting. Talking keychains. Yeah. Well, this, this is something that I like. I, I almost had this video shot this week, uh, but we have our big course coming up next weekend. We leave for the course. So uh, I'm going to set this project aside. I'll film it when I get back. Um, so the nuance and the expert expertise of craft are something that I really enjoy. Um, even when it comes down to something like keychain selection, might not be a big, might not think it's a big deal. Um, but if you are doing something that is truly um, important and operational in an emergency or, you know, high level operations setting, then, you know, I think we've all heard like uh, a space shuttle, one of NASA space shuttles blew up because of, you know, the wrong O-ring selection or something like that. Uh, so the metaphors are out there that something very small could really throw off a big operation. Um, let I have just looked at it so far under a time consideration, uh, but it's also a management, like a logistical issue, regardless of time. Just how do I manage these things that I'm holding in my hands? So let's imagine... For, I actually have them on my desk here. These are some different options. Let's say you have a regular standard keychain. like a uh, It's like the size of a American quarter. And it's just those two metal... Uh, it's one metal loop that goes around itself twice. There's a little zigzag in the middle where you kind of use your fingernail and kind of pry it apart. And then you get that first key. Like you have to really get the first hole in the bow of the first key. You have to get it in there. And then like you wedge it. And then you take the second key and you have to like kind of cheat and then you have to like scoot them all the way around 360 and then they're in the keychain, right? The regular, regular old key ring. Some problems with that. Uh, number one, if your fingernails are too short um, or even if they are not too short, it's still sometimes a pain in the dick just to get keys on and off. It's, it's, it's a, it's a fucking pain. And I think everyone knows that. And I don't think we'll have much of a disagreement there. Regular old standard key rings are a pain. If you're doing an operation where you have your spacing and depth keys, basically a known size cut of a key, you hold up to a target key and you go, okay, for this position, you know, is this cut to a, a really shallow one depth? Well, let's grab the one spacing and depth key and hold it up to it. Oh, no, too tall. Grab the two. Oh, that's a little closer. No, grab the three. Oh, look, that looks like a three because they're both level because we have a known height and an unknown height, which is pair them up, right? So hold one key next to the other. The spacing is so minuscule, the differences between the, all the different spaces, that if you leave your spacing and depth keys on a keychain, then you can't really get it flush up against another key. So this technique works best when the target key and your spacing and depth key are shoved together like pancakes, like one right on top of the other, flush. That's the best way to get a really proper and fast read. Notice I said a fast reading. So it's not really fast to take a standard quarter size key ring and to get your seven or eight or nine spacing and depth keys off. And then to hold each one up to your, to your target key and then to get all of your keys back on. And that's another operational consideration. Do you want to get all of your keys back on and stow your gear and then return the target key? Or should you have something like a, a drop pouch or a grab bag or a a sizable pocket or a fanny pack where you can go, okay, I got my spacing and depth keys off the key ring. I've measured the target key. Let me just dump all this shit in my pouch and I'll manage it later and I'll give the target key back to the target. All considerations, uh, all a lot of them are time-based and some of them are logistics-based. But what if you have a different type of keychain? So I have here, when it arrives in the mail, it is a colored as in like they come in green, yellow, blue, whatever, different colors. It's like a five or six inch long braided co plastic coated wire that's flexible. And there's a screw on each end with a screw sleeve over top of one of them. So 
you can slide seven keys onto this very quickly. You just hold seven keys in your hand, you line them up so that they're all you know facing the same way, and you just slide this wire right through the key, the you know the hole on all the keys. But then you have to grab the left side and the right side, and it takes two hands, and you have to hold these sides together. You have to bend them into a circle. You have to do you have a male and female end. You have to screw it together. And rotate, 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 spinning still, rotate. Okay, now the keychain is locked. Still an improvement over your standard quartered sized key ring, but there are some flaws and some problems. What if I only want one key to come off or two keys to come off? Um, and what if I only have one hand? Um, so things like that are kind of an issue. Quicker, slightly better. But what if we can go better? Well, I tried a small carabiner, which worked, um, except the carabiner in some places was small enough that I can get, you know, the, the keychain hole on a key. The key would fit into the carabiner, but not around the back, the spine, where they kind of press it and they put like an indentation on the carabiner. So the keys went almost all the way around the carabiner, free spinning, but then they kind of get wedged into one spot. Not great. So I said, can we improve more? Uh... So there are large key rings that are the size of maybe like a 50 cent piece. If you've ever seen one of those kids, um, it's maybe two or three times the size of a quarter. So it's a really large key ring. It's easier. You know, the, the wire gauge is thicker, so it's easier to manage. And I thought, eh, that's okay. Still not great. Tried that for a few reps. Um, and then I found an almost perfect solution that our students will be using in North Carolina next week for the advanced entry course, which is covert operations, planning an operation and carrying it out, which is way different than just emergency access. So this one is a very small carabiner and it's got a secondary carabiner clip on the inside internally. So it looks like a capital letter G, um, but it's closed off. So it's got two separate clip points. Um, there I have one, two, three, four, I have seven keys that are completely secured within this keychain on the very bottom. So I'm going to explain what's happening and you'll see it in real time or you'll hear it in real time. So seven keys. I'm going to open up the internal lock and all seven keys are out of that. So they're kind of in a staging area. I'm going to open up the outside lock and all seven keys are in my hand. Now I set all my keys down. I mix them up. I go, oh no, I got to get them back on my key ring. Cool. Well, here's how long that takes. They're all mixed up in my hand and ready to go. So I line these all up, I hold them by the blade, I just square them, and all seven keys are now back on my carabiner. About two seconds. So if you're doing real life Jason Bourne shit, and you are walking through a corporate environment, and you're snagging keys you know, off of someone's locker room key, key ring wall area, and you're going zip, 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 zip. Okay, this key is a five, two, three, one, five. Got it, put the key back. Uh, if you're doing something like that, which not everyone does, even super spies, I think, probably rarely do that. But if you are, those few seconds could be the make or break of your operation. So while this skill set, well, tactical lockpicking is used, I use it damn near every single week of my life somewhere to get into something. Um, key generation is really fucking cool and it has a huge impact on certain types of operations. But what we're teaching you, again, is not a technique. We're teaching you how to think about your skill sets. And that's so much better, in my opinion. Uh, in my defense, I, I went long on this. But in my defense, we did say this was going to be advanced concepts. So this is like, this is the stuff that we get super nerdy about. So hopefully you're enjoying this so far, because I sure am. Dave? Yeah, and that's cool, because this is where... There's always room for improvement, but this is where maybe you've got a lot of the gains that were on the table and easy to get for your entry skill set. This is where we're adding in those last few percent of improvement that are hard to get. You know, for any skill set, you kind of start plateauing at some level. And a plateau doesn't mean for anything that you, you know, stop improving, but just that the improvement slows way down. So this is the type of stuff, I think, that is... These these are those hard gains to get 
once people maybe start feeling like they're plateauing. So I think that's where this is super valuable to really just nerd out about this stuff. And for some people, that 4% difference might not matter. For some people, that 4% difference might be totally make or break. Uh, um, but yeah, so other gear staging. My second line bag uh, is actually a laptop bag because that makes sense for you know the types of things I do where I go. Now, I could fit a ton of tools in it if I just put them in willy-nilly, but I actually probably fit... Well, I know I definitely fit less tools than I could because I value being able to find things uh, by feel and have it separated out and accessible more so than just cramming a bunch of shit in there. So when it comes to staging gear as well, too, those are the trade-offs we're going to be talking about. It's going to be more valuable often... To find something without having to turn a light on, without having to look, find it by feel. And not only that, restage it. In real life, on an operation, or... I mean, even emergency access, I guess, it's not as big of a deal. But you don't want to dump out your whole second line bag, find the thing you need, and then just leave all your stuff on the ground, or not be able to fit it all back in, because you just kind of dumped it out, and you, you don't have time to fuss with getting it back in. Uh, so just other things on the staging gear considerations. Um, and then... Two, just drying off and cleaning your gear and restowing it. If you use delicate tools like easy decoders that might break, taking the time to maybe, if you have one, that's starting to look kind of bendy and worn. Just taking the time to stage a new one in there. I mean, but really, yeah, just staging gear too, I think is a thing that really sets advanced thinking apart in the entry skill set to once you're really starting to nerd out about staging your gear to set yourself up for success before you're even in a situation that you would need your gear. So you can have all the awesome tool and lock pairing knowledge. You can be an encyclopedia for key cutting and key depths, but if you haven't set yourself up for operational use to be able to put that into practice, that could be a big bottleneck on actually, you know, using it effectively in the real world. You got anything else on staging gear? Yes. There's a consideration to be made. And I think you could, there might be more, but off the top of my head, um, I like considering three options and they're kind of made organically. Um, but if you're making this decision on scene in real time organically and you've never considered it, you could be making a poor choice. Whereas if you know this concept and you think about it beforehand, it can really help your decision making process maybe go faster or be more beneficial so that you don't make the wrong choice. So the concept is this. Uh, it's really common in local law enforcement when you're hitting a small residential house that your team will stack up and they'll run up to the front door and politics aside, for whatever reason, if you're doing an entry on a home and you're going to use forced entry on the front door, you have basically, not always, but basically two options. You get to the front door. If it's a push door, you grab the battering ram and you smash through the front door. If it's a pull door, you take your pry bar or your, your hooli tool or halligan, whatever you want to call it, and you set the hooli tool and you pry the door towards you open. And then because those tools are big and bulky and heavy, and because interior doors are way easier to kick in, you often, in places like local law enforcement for a standard house hit, you will smash the door, and it, you're probably not doing this by yourself, so you peel out of the way, the rest of the team goes in, you drop your battering ram on the floor at the front door of the house, and then you're the last man in the house. If you happen to need that battering ram later, during your entry while you're taking rooms, you just go back to the front door, grab the battering ram, and go to your target that you need to make entry through. That makes sense, Dave? Yep, I'm following. Okay. For smaller tools, uh, especially for these th things that are uh, like the size of a key or a paper clip or something, um, and especially if you have a gear bag that they'll fit into, you now have two options. It's not just, okay, we get through the obstacle, then we drop our stuff on the floor for a specific reason, being we control the environment 
and we can come back and grab it if we need it, and we'll just pick it up on our way out when we're done. That's one of the reasons you drop it. Um, another option would be bring it with you, but like I said, because that environment's very active and very dangerous, you smash the door, drop the heavy object, you get everything safe or safe-ish, and then you go back for your tool if you need it. Not good for lock picking. Uh, many times in my life, I have dropped a lock picking tool while picking a lock. It lands at my feet, and I hear it hit the ground. Even in a clean environment, I've had this happen. I, I drop it. I hear it hit the ground. I go, I'll pick that up in just a second. I grab another tool from my pocket. I use it. I open the lock. I take my primary and my now secondary tool, put them in my pocket, and I go, all right, where's that tool that I dropped? Fucking gone forever. Happens all the time. So you have three options with smaller tools. You can access your door and drop your shit. Well, you could also drop your second line gear bag and move with just your, you know, what's in your pocket. So you can access your door and drop your shit and continue making entry and doing whatever the thing is inside the, you know, the facility. You can get the door to unlock so you can unlock a door and go, now it's unlocked. And then you can properly stow your tools in the same exact fashion as they're always stowed in. So put them in the right orientation, slip them into the right pockets, close the right zippers and the right clasps and put them into your cargo or your bag. So you're perfectly reset. But there's also a middle ground, which is I can take these tools out of their casing, make entry with them. And once I get entry, I can quickly drop these tools into any pocket or pouch or bag that I want and just keep moving. And then I can reset it later, either later in the operation or right after the operation. So there's three. Drop the tools and go. Stow the tools perfectly back in place and go. Or just kind of stow the tools in something and continue going. That's an advanced concept. And knowing why you're choosing that ahead of time is an advanced concept. Making a decision, you could maybe make the right decision organically without ever thinking about that. You can go, oh, look, I'm picking locks. Oh, look, the door's open. Oh, we either are or are not in a big rush. So I either will put them in my pocket and get to it later, or maybe I'll just drop them and rush in. That's fine. You could make the right decision on scene, having never thought about that. But we do the nuance, and we are experts at the craft. So these things we teach to people. Why do I always yell at yeah, the audience it, when I'm passionate? I'm not yelling. I'm just passionate. I promise. I'm not mad. Well, I'm not passionate. I'm not passionate. I'm just yelling. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, and entry as a skill set too. You had mentioned the battering ram. Entry, oftentimes, not always, though, might even have a bit more of a requirement of not leaving a ton of evidence or getting get out. Uh, so just a lot of stuff to think about where a little work upstream can set you up for success downstream when you're actually doing the thing and like you said i think in most cases you're that middle ground choice of just stowing it in a bag or somewhere once you've used it but not all the way back in the case is probably you know the middle ground for entry that's gonna be most common all right anything else on staging nope nope Okay, uh, software over hardware. One of the things we always, always talk about. Um, so we're going to lead this off with something that Sky Pirate and my over at Cloaked Entry Code do phenomenally is makeshift tools. And because it's software over hardware, it can sometimes be a lot faster just to make the tool on scene. Or even having to just go back to your car or vehicle can be a math equation of how long will it take me to go back there? How long does it take me to make something? Does that time matter? And no one can confiscate what's in your brain from you, whereas they can confiscate tools from you. All those things, just as far as making and using the tools themselves, advanced concepts too, it requires a deeper level of understanding beyond pairing the tool to the lock. It's understanding how and why things work, how to reproduce that, and the limitations of your makeshift tools as well. Brilliant. Yeah, they're very good at that. We actually just did an Instagram Live um, yesterday. I did one with um, Sky Pirate where um, 
I mentioned that early in my curriculum, I used to have off the top of my head, I think there were at least, no, there were four blocks of instruction that I taught the block with the official, you know, commercial grade tool. And then I made the two, the students make their own makeshift tool and get the same entry. Um, so there were four blocks where I did that. Uh, some of them off the top of my head were using a soda can to make a padlock shackle shim, uh, using paper clips, to pick open a lock. Um, uh, what was the other one using? Um, I can't remember. Uh, I know I did vehicle entries with, um, wire coat hangers and a blood pressure cuff. That was a fun, one, uh, makeshift version. And I did one, maybe two other ones. I can't remember, but I told the people on the live Instagram call that, um, we don't do that anymore. I don't think there's a single block of instruction I use uh, where we make the students do that. So now I mention it, I explain it to the students. Sometimes I'll show them a photo and I'll tell them that if they want some homework on the first night of class, they can do that. Um, but if you do like that kind of stuff, um, when I attended my and Sky's class, like that, their makeshift tools were a big deal. Like they put a lot of effort into teaching that. And it put a lot of effort into working with the students and getting those tools to work. And I thought that was really fucking cool. Um, and just for this community, I love this community of people that we collaborate with. And I love like seeing the ways that we teach things differently. Not, and again, like you always say, it's not a value judgment. It's great. Go teach whatever you want, however you want. And if we're the same in some areas, awesome. That means that we're both on track. If we're different in some areas, awesome. That means different students that want different things we'll get different things. So, um, just a small update. I no longer teach. It's not that I refuse to, but it just, it got pushed out of the curriculum. There were other things that were more important for the way that we teach, um, that makeshift tools, uh, took a backseat to that. I will say the main makeshift thing that I intentionally make time to drill on is restraint escapes. But besides that, I mean, I've done a lot of the other ones before. I've actually had a fair amount of soda can chimps, break off in the shackle yes in locks for me uh, but i mean that's what i was saying with understanding the limitations of your makeshift tools and i think that's the true mastery to have control over your makeshift tools which means you have workshop that enough to know oh no is this soda cam shim going to break off in the shackle leaving evidence that, that someone was messing with the lock or worse yet jamming the lock up and now it's much more difficult to get it to open period, even in, you know, a justified entry scenario. Uh, so last section we had, we still need to tie up that loose end when we started with, uh, yeah, when so would you that. choose a, a traveler's hook over a like latch gym tool? So take that one. Sure. I'll give you a short, quick answer. Um, I can already feel my brain getting ready to go long on this. Ugh. Okay. You don't say. I'll go, I'll go medium. I take it back. I misspoke. I'm not going to give you a short answer. I'm going to give you a medium answer. I only used latch gym tools for the first several years in my lock picking and entry journey. I even started teaching courses um, publicly, commercially, um, without ever having touched a traveler's hook. So um, there is a short part of this answer, which is, I have never thought to myself, oh, I'll use a latch gym tool. Oh, it's not good enough. I wish I had a traveler's hook. I never said that. But once I did finally bite the bullet and go, okay, let me try this traveler's hook thing. Then I went, oh, that's good. So my conclusion would be, if you get some latch gym tools, they'll work and they'll be great. It will, it will be a rare chance that those don't work. My other part of that conclusion answer is traveler's hooks are really fucking good. They give you a lot of dexterity. Things to consider, really, the difference just comes down to storage space. So if you're storing your uh, door latch gym, uh, it's probably easier because most of those are very flat and thin. Uh, Sparrows has one called the Molly Gym that goes into your Molly gear. Uh, but you have to cut off the tip in order to get the most out of it. For some reason, they shape the tip kind of strange. So I have students cut off the um, kind of the triangle portion of the edge of that. Um, but I've never had a latch gym uh, knowingly not work when a uh, traveler's hook would to answer that question. Okay, your turn. Yeah, I mean, and really the main thing with the, the traveler's hook is the spacing of the door to the frame has to allow for it depending on the model of hook. 
a flat gym might be able to fit in a tighter space, whereas a traveler's hook might not. But yeah, I think that level one answer is pairing the lock or uh, pairing the tool to the obstacle. So level one answer would be, oh, the space, the door frame. Level two answer would be, how do you carry it and how do you access it? So an advanced answer, advanced concept answer to that might be, okay, is it in your car or do you make the decision to carry it in a bag every day? And that's a whole discussion that's going to be dependent on people for what they're doing, where they are. Do they usually carry a bag with them every day? Do they not? Uh, so a lot to consider on that. But anything else on shim techniques that you wanted to hit on? Uh, no, we can do some of that later. Let's wrap this up. All right, all you. Serious shout out to the Patreon. Thank you so much. We are about to hit stop on the recording and then we're going to hit start again and we are going to kind of chillax a little bit on the technical content and we're just going to kind of have a good time and chat and kind of see where this goes. I really have been enjoying these after show um, recordings. You can get access to all of them at patreon.com backslash U-T-A-C. And if you support us at anything above the $2 level, you get instant access to all of our after shows. Uh, I've really enjoyed this. It's a nice kind of uh, change to get a different side of us. So that's a big help. Thank you. Next, if you want a high-quality protection dog, just shoot me an email, pat at utac.io. That's my email address. And I think that's it. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for checking us out. And uh, we did do a lot of basic concepts, so we figured we'd do something a little bit different, a little bit slightly more nerdy and in-depth this time. So we'll see, hopefully, all of you on the next one, and at least some of you we'll see on the after show.